Dear students, today I would like to demonstrate for you the anatomy of the female genital organs. Here you can see a picture about the structures, what we will see today. Uh, we will talk about the internal female genital organs first. Uh, we will see the ovaries, which are a paired organ. And after we will talk about the fallopian tube, which will form a connection between the ovary and the uterus. You see it's not a direct connection. It will help to the uh, uh, oocyte to go from the ovary towards the cavity of the uterus. After we will see the structure of the uterus and finally we will see the vagina. After the dissection of the abdominal cavity, uh, you saw the deepest part of the abdominal cavity, the organs which are located within the pelvis. Here you can see the parietal layer of the peritoneum, which will cover the organs within the female pelvis. What are those? From the superficial view, I hope you can recognize the organs. Here first we have the bladder, after we can see the uterus, and finally here we have the rectum. Let's see what are the main structures, what we have to describe. The first is the ovary. The ovary is located on the lateral wall of the pelvis. After, in front of, we can find the fallopian tube, which will form a connection with the uterus. And in the middle, you can see the body of the uterus, which is covered by the peritoneum. In front of the uterus, we saw the vesico-uterine pouch, and behind the uterus, between the rectum, this was the Douglas pouch, the recto-uterine pouch. It is really important to talk about the position of the organs in the pelvis in the mid-sagittal section, in the sagittal view. Here you can see this preparation. First, the bladder. After, we can see the uterus and the vagina. And finally, there is the rectum. You see very well the position of the vagina. It's not in the longitudinal direction. It goes posteriorly. And after, we have a flexure within the axis of the vagina and the uterus and the cervix, what I will tell you later. And that's why we can see this very special position, how the uterus is lying on the surface of the bladder. And depending on how many urine we have within the uh, bladder, the position of the uterus can change. Uh, over that here, we see uh, the parietal layer of the peritoneum. Here you see also the two pouches, the vesico-uterine pouch here and the recto-uterine pouch in this direction. On the lateral wall of the small pelvis, you can see the ovary. In front of the ovary will be the fallopian tube. And this is the body and the cervix of the uterus. And finally, the vagina. Let's see now uh, the structures, the description, the anatomical description of the ovary. First, I would like to talk about the different surfaces, the anatomical uh, relations with different organs and vessels. You heard the histology of the ovary earlier in the histology lectures. Now I would like to focus on the anatomical details uh, about the ovary. So here you can see the position of the ovary, as I told you. It is located on the lateral wall of the small pelvis. It has two surfaces. We can talk about the medial surface and the lateral surface. The medial surface is facing towards the uh, cavity. The lateral surface is fixed to the lateral wall of the small pelvis. It is located there, here, where we have the a division of the common uh, iliac artery. So this is the external iliac and here is the internal iliac and between them we can find the ovary here. 
This is uh, very important to mention here another anatomical relation. The ovary has a direct connection with the ureter too. The ureter is running behind the ovary on the surface of the external iliac artery. Here you can see the position of the ureter in the small pelvis. Uh, if you see a separated preparation from the internal genital organs, this is the anterior view and this is the posterior view of the organs. Uh, it is also visible that the ovary is located behind this very big and strong ligament which will be important in the fixation of the uterus and the organs to the wall of the pelvis. The name of this ligament is the broad ligament of the uterus or ligamentum latum uteri. Here you can see that it will fix the uterus, it will cover and fix the fallopian tube and it will cover one part only, just one uh, part of the surface of the ovary. That part of the ovary which will be fixed by this ligament uh, this is uh, called the mesovarian surface, but first I would like to demonstrate for you the other part, which is not covered by the peritoneum. This is called the margo liber, or free margin. We know very well that uh, through the ovary we have the ovulation, so that's why we have to have one part of the ovary which is not covered by the peritoneum. So this is this free surface what you can see uh, in this picture. And the other margin, what I wanted to show, the mesovarial margin, this is that part where the ovary will be fixed to the broad ligament and that part of the ovary will be covered by peritoneum, which is simple squamous epithelium. We can talk about two poles, two extremities of the ovary. One of it is the vascular pole or the tuberian pole, which is facing towards the abdominal opening of the fallopian tube. And the other pole is called the uterine pole, which is fixed with the proper ovarian ligament to the body of the uterus. So uterine pole, and here the vascular pole or the tuberian pole. Why is it vascular pole? Because the ovarian artery, which will originate from the abdominal aorta, will reach the ovary in this pole. I told you that the surface or the covering of the ovary will change. One part is covered by a simple squamous epithelium which is the peritoneum and we can see very well this border where it will change to simple cuboidal epithelium. This line is called the Ferre line. It is visible on the surface of the ovary in the dissecting room. Here we can see the picture, a schematic picture about the ovary in an active stage. In an active stage, when we have ovulation, the ovary could be uh, more centimeter. In, uh, if we see our cadaver, these are after the menopause, so these uh, ovaries, they are not active, that's why they are much more smaller compared to the active uh, stage. So, uh, if we see this picture, on the surface you can see that point where the ovulation will be and we can see also that that this point will change um, every uh, month so uh, it is really important that to move the ovary uh, to that position where this point will be closer to the abdominal orifice of the fallopian tube it is a good question is it possible to move the movement of the ovary. Yeah, here we have a movement. How does it move? Here we can see the proper ovarian ligament, which is located there, which will fix the ovary towards the uterus. 
Here we can see the other ligament, which is called the suspensory ligament. It is not a real ligament. Here we have the ovarian artery and the ovarian veins, which will supply the ovary. It will form a protrusion on the surface of the peritoneum, and that's why we can see it like a ligament. But within these structures, we can find smooth muscle cells, so that's why uh, because of the movement of this ligament, we have a little rotation like this on the surface or in a position of the ovary. So with this uh, movement, uh, there is a possibility to say that at that position where we have the ovulation, it will, can, uh, it will move closer towards the abdominal orifice of the fallopian tube. Here we can see the endoscopic uh, picture of the ovulation. This is the surface of the ovary and it is very visible where the tertiary follicle will form a protrusion on the surface, it's called stigma. And there we can see the secondary oocyte after the ovulation. Here you can see it very well. Uh, I told you that here we have no direct connection between the ovary and the fallopian tube. The fimbriae of the fallopian tube, which are there, they will move towards the surface of the ovary and will cover the surface of the ovary, but as I told you, we have no direct connection between them. So the ovulation will be towards the abdominal cavity and the oocytes, they have to find a way towards the abdominal pole of the fallopian tube, towards the cavity of the uterus. And of course, unfortunately, we could have problem with this uh, procedure. And in this case, we can see that the, then the implantation will be within the cavity of the abdominal, uh, within the abdominal cavity. For example, we can see implantation on the surface of the ovary or in the Douglas pouch or on the surface of the intestine. In this case, we are talking about ectopic pregnancy, extra uterine pregnancy. I would like to show you a movie, a video, about this ovulation. So here we can see the surface of the ovary and the graphium follicle. And this is here on the surface of the graphium follicle. Uh, you see the movement of the fimbriae of the fallopian tube. They are moving with very special chemotactic movement. This is the secondary oocyte there. The secondary oocyte is covered by granulosa cells. Here you can see how the fimbriae help, they help to uh, move the uh, egg towards the cavity of the uterus. Here we can see the kinesidia of the fallopian tube. And this is the end of the canal, the cavity of the uterus. Normally, the fertilization will be here within the ampullary part of the fallopian tube and after the implantation will be within the cavity of the uterus. Now, I would like to continue with the description of the fallopian tube. Here you can see the two structure, tube-shaped structure. First, it will originate from the uterus, it's called the uterine orifice of the fallopian tube. After we have a very small, narrower portion when it goes through the myometrium, this is called the uterine part of the fallopian tube. After, we have a narrower part which is called the isthmus. And finally, we can see the ampullary part and the infundible at the abdominal orifice of the uh, fallopian tube.
here you can see. And on the, at the end, here are these finger-like protrusions. These are the fimbriae. I told you the function of these structures. I have to talk about the blood supply of the ovary and the uterine tube together. I told you that there are two different vessels which are involved in the blood supply of these structures. The first one is the ovarian artery, which will originate from the abdominal aorta. We will see it during the dissection of the retroperitoneum. They will originate from here, somewhere from here, from the abdominal aorta. And after we'll go downward, they will form a suspensory ligament, what I mentioned to you before. And at the vascular pole, we are rich the ovary. The other vessel which will supply, this will be the uterine artery, it will originate from the internal iliac. From the uterine artery we have uh, branches towards the fallopian tube, rami dubari, tuberian branches, and we have ovarian branches too, and they will form an estomosis with the branches of the ovarian artery. This very rich anastomosis will be within the double layer of the peritoneum. And you can see that from the uterine artery, we have additional branches too downward, which will supply the cervix and the vagina too. I would like to tell you some words about the fertilization. It is important embryological topic, but this is really important to mention here uh, in the anatomy lecture too. I told you that the uh, fertilization will be within the ampulla of the fallopian tube, and after uh, the fertilized egg will go towards the cavity of the uterus, and in the blastocyte form, will be implanted to the endometrium at the end of the first week. And this is the way uh, where we could have problems because the fallopian tube has a very, very irregular surface and a very narrow lumen. So that's why the uh, egg could be implanted in a different parts of the fallopian tube. For example, on the surface of the fimbriae, or most frequently in the ampullary part, or in the isthmus, here you can see the abnormal positions of the ectopic pregnancy. Why is it important to know? Because this is a very, very severe clinical uh, problem. Uh, we can check it with ultrasound uh, examination, where is the position of the implantation, and if it is not within the wall, within the wall of the uterus, and it is located, for example, here you can see in this picture is close to the um, ovary within the fallopian tube. Unfortunately, in this case, we have to finish uh, this uh, pregnancy with abortion because. Uh, if the embryo will grow there, because there we have a very good blood supply, uh, we can rupture the fallopian tube. Here you can see this tragedy on the fallopian. Here we have a rupture within the fallopian tube. And from this, we could have a very huge bleeding and it could be a life threatening condition uh, for the pregnant woman. Here you can see the structure of the fallopian tube, what I told you. Because of the irregular surface, we could have this abnormal implantation. That is what you heard in the histological uh, uh, lectures. And of course, after different inflammations, we could have like, this extra uh, connective uh, tissue within the lumen, which can close it. And in this case, the, uh, uh, the uh, secondary oocyte and the egg is not able to go through the fallopian tube to the lumen of the uterus. How can we examine 
the lumen of the fallopian tube. We can examine this with a special uh, contrast uh, material. If we uh, give contrast material towards the cavity of the uterus, if we have free fallopian tube, the contrast material will go through the lumen towards the abdominal cavity. This is called the hysterosalpingogram. If we have a closure within the fallopian tube, of course, we do not see this communication. In this case, of course, we need special artificial fertilization to help uh, the pregnancy of the women. After uh, the next point is the anatomy of the uh, uterus and first I would like to talk about the main parts of the uterus. What are the main parts of the uterus? This is a very frequent question in the anatomy exam and this is really important to know that we have two main structures, two main parts. The first part is called the body of the uterus which is approximately 4.5 centimeter and this is the neck of the uterus 2.5 is the length of it and we can talk about the fundus of the uterus but the fundus is not a separated part of the uterus it is only just one part of the body which is located there between the two fallopian tubes um, this is the apical part of the uh, body of the uterus so it's not a separated part of it the relation of these uh, parts will change after the uh, pregnancy. Here you can see the body will be bigger compared to the length of the cervix. If we see the cervix, we can divide the cervix into two main parts based on the insertion of the wall of the vagina. That part which is located above the fornix called fornix. That part which is located above the fornix of the vagina, this is called the supravaginal part of the cervix. And that which is located within the vagina, this is called the vaginal part of the neck or portio vaginalis. On the surface, here we can see the external orifice or the ostium uh, uteri. Uh, if we see the cavity of the uterus, within the body we can talk about a triangular shape, a very narrow lumen. This is called the cavity of the uterus, the cavum uteri. From this will originate the fallopian tube. This is the uterine orifice of the uh, uterine tube. And there you can see the continuation of it towards the cervical canal. This is called the internal mouth of the uterus, orificium internum, the Latin term of it. This middle part, which is located at the border between the body and the cervix, this is called the isthmus of the uterus. After we will go towards the cervical canal within the cervix, and finally, we can see the external mouth of the uterus, or orificium externum uteri, this is the Latin term of it. Let's see the layers of the uterus. We can talk about three different layers. You see the structures in the histo practice. The innermost uh, layer is called the endometrium. After the thickest layer is called the myometrium and finally the peritoneum will cover this on the surface. This is called the perimetrium. These are the three main layers. You so saw the histological structures of the endometrium in the uh, histopractice and the histo lecture. Let's see now the structure of the myometrium. The myometrium uh, it's uh, visible in the slides only just in a very small portion of the slide of the uterus. And, uh, but of course, it is much more thicker. We can talk about uh, a very, very vascularized layer, innermost layer. This is called the stratum vasculosum. Uh, 
And of course, we have one, uh, one layer, uh, a strab vascular layer, which is located uh, close to the endometrium. And we can talk about also supravascular layer, which is closer towards the um, perimetrium. So these are the three main layers of the myometrium. And here you can see the position of the smooth muscle cells. The position of the smooth muscle cells, it is really important during the birth, during the delivery. We know very well that uh, in the case of pregnant uterus, the length of the smooth muscle cells, they will change. Maybe it could be 500 micrometer one smooth muscle cells. And the position of the cells, it is uh, really important for the really effective uh, contraction of the uterus uh, during the delivery. Here we can see uh, the changes of the uterus uh, during the pregnancy, the first trimester, the second trimester, and finally the third trimester. We see very well that the cervical part is closed, only just at the end of the pregnancy will be dilatated, but the isthmus can fuse to, here you can see, incorporated into the uterine uh, cavity and the wall of it. It has a similar histological picture or histological characteristic like the body uh, of the uterus. So these, here you can see the changes of the ratio of different parts. I have to mention one uh, disorder of the myometrium and the smooth muscle cells. Uh, this is called the leiomyoma, the benign tumor of the smooth muscle cells. Here you can see this tumor could be within the wall of the myometrium of the uterus in the myometrium or could be within the cavity, it's called intracavitary uh, position or like um, process could be out or within the cavity, abdominal cavity. So of course here these are very severe conditions and if we have such a huge amorphous uh, myometrium in this case, we need the operation of this, um, of this organ. But if we have only just a smaller abnormality, of course, we can operate it just separately and later won't have problem during the pregnancy. So this is really important to treat this condition as soon as we can, because in this stage, we are not able to save the uterus uh, of the patient. Uh, finally, uh, at the end of the description of the uterus, I would like to show you those ligaments which will help in the fixation of the uterus to the wall of the pelvis. The broad ligament of the uterus, I mentioned to you, the double layer of the peritoneum, which will cover the fallopian tube, which will fix the ovary, and will cover the body of the uterus too. Vesarius wrote that this is like an uh, ala vespertilionis, it's called the ala of the bat, you know, it was so similar. Uh, that's why uh, this was the original name of this very special structure. If we do a section in this direction, after I can show you the position of the different parts, of the broad ligament of the uh, uterus. The upper part is called the mesosalpinx. It will cover and fix the fallopian tube. That double layer which will fix the ovary is called the mesovary. And finally, the double layer which will be there um, next to the body of the uterus is called the mesometrium. So here you can see the position of these structures in the longitudinal section. Uh, I mentioned earlier the position of the uterus and the different pouches, what we 
have to know, which are the lowest parts of the abdominal cavity. We can talk about the vesico-uterine pouch between the urinary bladder and the uterus. And behind the uterus, we can descri describe the recto-uterine pouch. The author name was the Douglas pouch. Also, I told you that this is the lowest part of the abdominal cavity. So if we have blood or fluid there, this will be uh, the way how we can do physical examination and we can palpitate through the posterior wall of the vagina. And uh, of course now in the clinical practice they do not use this uh, therapeutic interventions, the Douglas pouch or Douglas puncture, but for you it's important to know that the posterior wall of the vagina has indirect connection with the uh, recto uterine pouch and this is the way how we can examine during physical examination the lowest part of the abdominal cavity. Let's see now the position of the uterus. Also I mentioned this normal anatomical position. The axis of the vagina it's going a little posteriorly. Here you can see it will form an angle with the longitudinal direction. And compared to the position of the axis of the vagina, here you can see the axis of the cervix. Between the axis of the cervix and the axis of the body of the uterus, we have also another angle. And uh, uh, if you are talking about these angles, the first one uh, is approximately 1, 110 degree. This position is called, this is the anteversion of uh, the uterus. And if we see this angle between the cervix and the body, this is 150, 160 uh, degree. This is called the anteflexion of the uterus. So if you would like to describe the normal position of the uterus, we have to use these anatomical terms. Uh, of course we have to mention other ligaments too, which can help to fix the uterus in this normal position. The first ligament, what I would like to show here, this is the round ligament of the uterus, which is located within the inguinal canal. Uh, it has more uh, important function during the pregnancy, which fix the pregnant uterus uh, to the inguinal canal, to the anterior part of the pelvis. And there we can see the parametrium between the two layers of the peritoneum. This is called the parametrium. It is a connective tissue system which will contain the vessels, the nerves, connective tissue, um, which will fix also the body of the uterus. It's, it's located between the two layers of the peritoneum. Uh, within the horizontal direction, I can show you the cardinal ligament. This is also really important within the anatomy of the pelvis. It will divide the different uh, parts, the different spatium, different spaces of the small pelvis. Professor Kish will talk about these systems in another lecture. This is the horizontal section. Only I would like to mention you those ligaments, what I told you, which are involved, uh, which are within the uh, small pelvis, and Dr. Kish will talk about it. So uh, this ligament, which will fix the uterus to the lateral wall of the small pelvis, this was the cardinal ligament. Of course, we have ligaments which will fix the uterus to the bladder. This is called the vesico-uterine ligament. And we have ligament between the bladder and the pubic bone. This is the pubovesical ligament. And posteriorly, we can find also important ligaments. We have ligament between the sacrum and the uterus. This is called the sacro-uterine ligament, which is within the recto-uterine fold. And between them, this is the recto-uterine pouch, the Douglas pouch, 
what we saw during the dissection of the abdominal cavity. Let's see again the, the, the blood supply. The blood supply of the body and the vagina and the cervix. Uh, also, we have to mention the ovarian artery. You know, it will go, it will supply the fallopian tube and the ovary. And there you can see the other important vessel of the female genitalia organ, which is the uterine artery, which will originate from the internal iliac. And we can talk about maybe a vaginal artery, which could be a separated branch from the internal iliac or could be a branch of the uterine artery too. They form a very rich meshwork within the double layer of the peritoneum. Here you can see that. I showed you this picture earlier. And this is how they reach, how they supply the wall of the uterus. It is really interesting that during the pregnancy, the structure of these vessels, they can also rupture it. I mean the internal and external uh, uh, elastic membranes. So if we examine the structure of the vessels, the wall of the vessels in uh, the uterus, we can see how many pregnancies we had during the life of the patient because it's like a ring of the tree. They will show this uh, ruptures within the wall. Okay. Uh, I would like to mention here a very important anatomical cross point. The uterine artery will form a final cross point of the, with the ureter in the small pelvis. We also frequently this anatomical cross point during the body tour of the uh, pelvis. There we can see, of course, a very rich uh, venous plexus too. This is the uterovaginal venous plexus, which will collect the venous blood of these organs and will drain to the iliac vein. And of course, here you can see the ovarian veins, which will drain to the left uh, renal vein here and there in the right side to the inferior vena cava. Of course, we could have abnormalities within the position of the uterus. We can talk about retroflexion. In, uh, here you can see that the body of the uterus is located posteriorly next to the rectum. Or retroversion, when the cervix it is also in this posterior uh, position. And if we have problem with the ligaments and the urogenital diaphragm, but you will learn later. Unfortunately, in this case, the uterus can fall through the vagina. It could be the prolapsed uterus, which is also really dangerous because inflammation could be through this uh, uh, position. So it's really important to renovate, to do a renovation within the ligaments of the pelvis. And finally, the last part of the uterus, this is the cervix. That part of the cervix which is located within the cavity of the uh, vagina, this is called the portio vaginalis. Uh, if we see the external orifice, uh, you see differences between uh, the shape. This one we see if we have no pregnancy earlier and the orifice will be enlarged if we had earlier delivery. We can talk about anterior lip and posterior lip of the cervix. We have to mention that unfortunately the cervical cancer is one of the most frequent uh, types of uh, female uh, cancer. So uh, this is a very slowly uh, growing tumors. So we can, um, we can do special tests, controls every year. And uh, in this case, we can um, save uh, our life with a control. How can we do that? Yeah, I put this picture because one of the most famous patients who have um, 
cervical uh, cancer, what uh, we know. This was Eva Perron. So here we can see uh, the histological examination of the cells, what we can collect uh, from the portio vaginalis and from the fornix. This is called the Papa Nicolaou staining. With this staining, we can examine the abnormal cell types. And this is what we can do every year or every second year to check uh, this uh, cancerous uh, position. And it is very important to know that we have now vaccination because the human papilloma virus is behind this uh, abnormality. And now the young uh, uh, women, so the girls around 12 years old, they have possibility to get the vaccination against this virus which can cause the cervical cancer. And finally, I would like to tell you some words about the anatomy of the vagina. Based on the position, we have difference between the anterior and posterior wall of the vagina. That part where it will fix towards the cervix is called the fornix of the vagina, the anterior and the posterior fornix. And there laterally, we can mention the lateral fornices. And of course, it's, these are not separated structures because they will form, a fornix will form like a ring around the cervix. Above the lateral fornix of the vagina, we run uh, the ureter. It is very important anatomical uh, position. And uh, finally, uh, it will open uh, into the vestibule. Uh, of the vagina. Here we can see transverse rugae, rugae vaginalis. You saw this in the histological pictures of the vagina. And we have to mention another anatom anatomical structure, which is the hemen. It is located within the cavity between the two parts. Uh, those parts, they have different embryological origin. There we have this membrane which could have different parts. In our cadaver, maybe we can see only just a remnant of it within the wall, within the lumen of the vagina. And finally, only just some words about the lymphatic drainage and the innervation of the internal organs. The, what are the lymph nodes, what we have to mention? The lumbar lymph nodes, they are located around the abdominal aorta. They will collect the lymph from the fallopian tube and from the ovary because, of course, the ovary and vein will drain into the inferior vena cava and here in the left side, the renal vein. So that's why the lymph will go upward towards the lumbar lymph nodes. We have to mention the iliac lymph nodes, which are uh, around the common iliac, external and internal iliac uh, vessels. Uh, the superficial inguinal lymph nodes, they are also really important because the external genitalia and one part of the uterus will drain too because the round ligament of the uterus will go to the inguinal can canal. So this is the way how the uterine, one part of the uterus will drain to the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. And we can talk about, of course, deep inguinal lymph nodes too. And behind the uterus, with the ligaments, which will fix it towards the sacrum, the lymph can drain to the sacral lymph nodes. Finally, only just some words about the innervation of these organs. Here you can see that the vegetative fibers will originate from the different parts of the spinal cord. The sympathetic uh, fibers will originate from the lower thoracic segment and the sacral part will form the parasympathetic fibers and all together they will form a very rich plexus which is called the hypogastric nerve and the hypogastric plexus which will supply and which will innervate the organs.
And finally, the last picture about the external genitalia. Only just show you the schematic picture. All of the details will be in the lecture of Professor Kish when you will see the urogenital diaphragm. Here, the clitoris, you will talk about the clitoris, the uh, rima pudendi, the external uh, labia, the labia maiora, minora pudendi, and the vestibule and the greater vestibular glands. You will hear about these structures in the lecture of Professor Kish. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention with my uh, favorite picture from Toulouse, the mother and the child. This is my favorite picture. So thank you so much for your attention.